Hello and happy Friday. Welcome to Women at Arden's March presentation. I'm Becky Hurley and I'm Chief Development Counsel for Arden Health Services, as well as a member of Women at Arden's Steering Committee and Editorial Committee. I'm going to be your host today. First, I'd like to start by mentioning just a couple of housekeeping items while everyone's getting settled. <laughs> Principally, that all our participant lines are muted so that you'll have better audio quality. But that doesn't mean we're not interested in your questions and comments because we treasure your feedback. So if you'll please use the chat function on your WebEx to send us any comments, questions, or feedback you have, we'll be monitoring it throughout the seminar. I'd also like to begin by touching on the purpose of Women at Ardent as we do every time. So it's there on your screen. It's to network with and learn practical solutions from Arden's own women leaders, sharing our industry knowledge and leadership experience. Our goal is to support all women in our organization to overcome gender barriers and to prepare themselves for leadership opportunities. And I love to start, I love this first part today because I have the pleasure of recognizing a woman of Ardent who truly personifies not only our purpose, but also Ardent's larger purpose of caring for others. Her name is Markayla Wallace, and she is a registered nurse at UT Health in Jacksonville, Texas. Recently, we, see, we received a letter from a member of Markayla's community about her, and I'm going to read it to you now. Last week, I was in a car accident. A woman named Markayla stopped to help me and my family. She told me she was a nurse, and I believe she said she worked at UT. She was an angel. She helped me with my kids. I just wanted to brag on one of your employees. The patients at your hospital are so blessed to have such a selfless, kind person helping them. I don't know what I would have done if she and her friend had not stopped to help me. Markayla, thank you, kudos to you, and please know how grateful we all are that we're on your team. Now, our final housekeeping item has to do with Women at Ardent and our effort to expand its footprint. We'd like to have a champion in every Ardent facility, location, or clinic. So if you're interested, I hope you will take uh, a time to fill out the questionnaire that is attached to the QR link on the screen and let us know. Champions help elevate women in their organization and, pro pro and promote women at our programs, such as the one we're participating in today, as well as other networking events. It's about a two to three hour commitment per month for a year. So if you're interested, please complete the questionnaire, which will be reviewed by the steering committee and someone will get back with you in due course. You can also email us at women at ardenthealth.com if you have any questions that haven't been addressed here. And by the way, if you aren't quick enough to get your phone right now, I'm gonna put that QR code back up at the end of the session. I'll also tell you that being part of Women of Art at Ardent enables you to meet people that you won't necessarily meet in your day job and to be, feel as a part of a bigger enterprise. It's been a wonderful opportunity that I've loved. And if you have any interest, I really encourage you to fill out that questionnaire. So now it's time to get on with our program. Our topic today is the power of resilience and growth women demonstrate during challenging circumstances. Resilience and growth. In my life, I don't think I can, or certainly in my adult life, I cannot think of a time where resilience and growth have been more needed than the last 12 months, as all of us have dealt individually with the COVID-19 pandemic and what's happened to all of our lives. <laughs> and we know that that impact has been disproportionately felt by women in our home lives, in our work lives, on our physical health, and on our emotional well being. So, we thought this was a perfect time to pull together a trio of women leaders from Arden's Loveless Health System in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and ask them to share with us their personal journeys through this challenge and their strategies for getting through it. Because we've all gone through this together, but we've each had a different road to travel. So, we've called upon Nancy Cole, Serena Pettis, and Bree Waite to join us and have a conversation about that. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves because they can tell their stories better than I can. But I do wanna let everyone know something about Nancy. 
She's been an active participant in Women at Arden since its inception. And although she retired only last month, we said, Nancy, there's just this one more thing we need you to do. So we really appreciate her being here with us today. And before I turn it over to them, please note that all three of these women are fully vaccinated. So please don't worry about the fact that they're indoors together without masks. So Nancy, I, sh I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Oh, we are so um, just really blessed to be able to share with you our personal experiences. And we do want you to know, though, that um, our experiences are no more valuable than any of yours. It's just that um, we have this great opportunity and we thought we'd go ahead and share our personal stories and then talk a little bit about how we coped and our, our takeaways. So. Um, we're, I'm going to start with Serena Pettis, and Serena, if you'll introduce yourself and talk about, you know, what this past year meant to you and your your life. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Serena Pettis. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Business Development for Loveless, and I oversee um, not only the marketing, advertising, um, business development and outreach uh, for the providers across our state, but also our one call team, which is a team of nurses that helps to coordinate transfers for patients who need higher level of care um, into Loveless, as well as our care concierge team who helps patients establish with a specialist for Loveless Medical Group. So in in my experience, from a personal perspective, my husband is also in the New Mexico National Guard. So last year, when COVID started, he, um, in, in February, had to go to um, Richmond, Virginia, to Fort Lee for his um, advanced military training. So I was left at home with our three-year-old daughter at the time, and it was an overwhelming experience. But at the same time, I feel like we got into a groove. And even though it was difficult, I found my way. Um, but it was overwhelming. My mom had just moved to Albuquerque. She's ill. She has a lung disease, uh, a neurological um, disease as well. And so I wanted to keep her safe. Um, in addition to being available for my daughter and her needs, our demanding job and everything my colleagues were going through. And also um, my dad got COVID. So that was really hard. And he lives in Denver, so I couldn't be there with him. So there was just a lot, I think, that contributed on a personal level. From a professional level, the departments that I oversee, we have a connection and a responsibility to to the community, to the media. We had to respond to them timely. We had to get the media the information that they needed. We had to get our community the information they needed, our patients. Um, everything was changing. Communication was um, just coming at us at so many different levels. And we had to respond and we had to adapt and we had to pivot even our marketing campaigns to make sure that our community knew to not delay your care and to continue uh, feeling comfortable coming to our hospitals and to continue seeing your doctors. Um, and it was important for us from an outreach perspective with our providers in the community to, our, to now instead of going in person to visit with them, it all changed to WebExes and educating them on proper ways that they can care for their patients in their communities without having to transfer them to Loveless if they did not have to. But at the same time, being available for them, getting them the equipment that they needed, getting them the information that they needed, the tools that they needed, getting Dr. Sandoval, our chief medical officer, as well as our other leaders within Loveless, to help get that message out to those providers. Um, and, and also making sure that we were available for our employees. We had that responsibility too, to get them the information that they needed, the education that they needed from everyone from our nursing team to our clinical staff, but all the way even into our HR departments and the finance department and payroll and all of the other employees of Loveless that craved and needed this information. So at the end, I, I felt this stronger connection to Loveless employees, to our community, to our staff. And for that, I'm, I'm grateful. Nice. 
I think um, I'm going to switch over to Bree here in a second, but I think what you're going to hear probably are a lot of things that resonate with you all. And certainly we want you to um, feel free to enter the chat uh, if, if things resonate or if you had different experiences, because I think we need to learn from each other. Um, and I think you'll also hear as we give our story how they how they're very similar in some ways. So, uh, Bree, um, why don't you talk about your experience? Um, I think that um, of anyone, and I think important to this audience is a leader who was there at the front at the front line um, of caring for these patients. So. Yeah, um, the last year has been an experience unlike any other uh, leading an ICU, and also just as a, a woman and a human. Um, it's one of the only times in history that we have been globally connected uh, through an event, the good, the bad, the otherwise. And for us here in New Mexico, it sort of just came on like a thunderstorm and this huge influx of patience and information and just came rolling in and we did our best to adapt and we sort of went into emergency mode and we're trying to adapt to massive amounts of information and not really being 100% confident in how to care for our patients or how to keep ourselves safe. And um, we just kind of went into the units and went to work and tried to adapt as we could. Um, but the intense amount of information and patient population that came in in the beginning led to an intense feeling of fear. Um, I was afraid, my staff was afraid, we weren't sure we were being safe for ourselves or taking care of our patients appropriately. And then were we going to be the people that made our loved ones sick? Were we going to take this disease home to our families? Um, we all implemented various forms of some regime of going home and I got undressed in my garage and disinfected my shoes and had a robe and showered before I ate, even if it was a 14 hour day. Um, and I know that was even tenfold for my staff that were working four or five days a week in order to accommodate the volumes of patients that we had in the intensive care unit. And I have to say that in the middle of this, even though it was overwhelming, we had New Jersey nurses come out from a sister facility and support us and help us. And the sense of community and wholeness and collectiveness was so moving and supporting. And that is part of what pushed us past that first part where it felt as though we were doing a sprint. And then as it kept going on, it was clear that we were in this for a long period of time. They were going to be doing a marathon. And that is when the burden truly hit the shoulders of all of the nurses. It was no longer going to come and go. And school started to close. Online classes started for kids. So the nurses were taking on not only the role of wanting to support their coworkers, their hospital, their patients, but they also had to become teachers. And not just teachers for their kids, but also teachers for their families and oftentimes their communities, as there was this influx of misinformation on social media and the world turned to nurses to see what the truth was and what the answers could be. Wow. And as we progressed further down into COVID, we started to see that, well, my dad ended up getting surgery and that was a really eye-opening experience to be completely disconnected from him in that process. Um, it, was, it was terrifying and I reflected on that in my own practice and with my nurses and realizing that they were that piece of compassion for all the patients that didn't have their families present holding their hands or touching them. That was the nurses. They were the ones at the bedside being that final contact with someone as they passed, holding up an iPad and a hand and crying into an N95 when they couldn't blow their nose. Um, and that was, that strength is what kept me going through the rest of the year and will continue to keep me going um, if there is another surge. And I want that to be the thing that we focus on moving forward. Wow. So um, I need to give you just a tad of background before I weave my personal story. Um, I have um, five children, four married, grandchildren, um, and a father um, who was living with me uh, up until 
well, I took, we, we had a break because sometimes you need a break when you have a 89 year old dad and uh, is living with you and has been living with you for several years. And my brother had moved back from Arkansas. So, uh, and lived on the West side and I live South of Albuquerque. So dad um, was with Craig for a short period of time. But when COVID hit, we felt that the better decision was for him to stay with my brother. Um, and so, you know, uh, initially, because again, we didn't know um, how serious this virus was, we wanted to protect everybody. We, we stopped all of our uh, in-person um, gatherings. So um, I really, I'm a type of person that I give my all to work and what I have left is for my family. So not being able to really spend time with them was very difficult. Um, as far as professional, um, you know, I had been at uh, Loveless Medical Center for a little less than a year. I had great plans and visions um, for what we were gonna do here at the medical center. And we were just getting things launched. My leadership team was um, really coming together and we were starting to focus on the next level and COVID hit. And when it hit, it hit fast and hard here. Um, New Mexico wasn't quite ready. We found ourselves doing all the contact tracing uh, before they got their, um, their infrastructure put together. Just like um, Serena talked about, we had, and, and you did too, we had communication changing hourly, if not daily. And, you know, um, I kind of laugh and I was sharing with Serena, you know, I get these text messages from Serena or Whitney saying, can you speak to KOB or can you go ahead and approve that policy? Can you do this? Can you do that? And I'm like, I have 10 other meetings. Yes, I sure can. Um, you know, so you found yourself just really working hard, working fast, working longer hours, working the weekends. And, you know, that, that, and as I said, I focus on work. When I'm at work, I'm at work. Nothing gets in my way. Well, so we got through that first surge and we had a, a bit of a decline. And, and many of you know that the governor of New Mexico was probably one of the strictest governors in the country, um, closing us down frequently, um, uh, telling us we couldn't travel out of state, but we had this little bitty window uh, during the summer. And all of my trips, of course, had been canceled. And I had, a, I had planned to take a few days to drive to Montana where my sister was equally socially distanced and have a little bit of a reprieve. And I was gonna go alone, but I decided to take my dad. Well, it was a really good thing that I took my dad. And my father at 89, just so you know, he was clear. He was still, um, he had his concealed carry. Uh, he, he could shoot at 99% accuracy, just so you know. Um, he was still driving, very independent. And um, so we took to the road um, went to visit with my sister for a few days, came home, and um, in um, early September, I noticed, and, and he had resumed, you know, he had done really well. Um, we resumed having our Sunday breakfast together, so he would drive down to where I live. We'd have breakfast. Well, I noticed that he was getting a little bit uh, more fragile looking to me and, um, and a little more weak, and then came to... Um, a Sunday and I said, are we gonna do breakfast? No, I don't feel like it. And um, by the end of the next week, my brother called me and said that he had collapsed at his home. We had him admitted, uh, long story short, um, took him home on hospice the next week because he had masses in his lungs that we weren't aware of. Um, I don't think you're ever really ready to lose a parent. I certainly wasn't 89, you know, my daddy. Um, um, he rallied as most do. My brother and sister were there and we had made plans that um, we would have to put him in an um, assisted living because I had to go back to work and somebody needed to care for him. But on his own terms, he passed away before we moved him. And I'm sorry. Um, then um, I had a planned surgery that I'd been postponed and I needed to have. So 10 days later I had surgery and I was at home for um, several weeks and I couldn't do anything. And of course I mourned, I grieved, I'm sure I was depressed. Um, and I felt guilty not being at work um, because I felt guilty for my staff. Um, you know, I, I didn't, I felt torn. How do I help them with their emotional and 
uh, mental distress and I'm focusing on myself. And so um, <clears throat> when I went back to work, um, you know, still unsure of the step that I did take, um, Mr. Stern, our, our division president, gave me a job. He said, Nancy, I'd like you to um, take care of our vaccination uh, program for our employees for the whole, dis uh, the whole division. And um, coming in, you know, having been off for a while, it looked like a good thing for me to do. And and um, he doesn't know this, and I didn't share this with him. But um, that opportunity gave me more opportunity to focus on something. Where as a CNO, as you know, especially of a bigger hospital, you are here, there, and yonder, um, trying to make things happen. Um, it made me start feeling good about what I was doing because you know I had all these plans. For us, COVID came in, you know, that was our priority. Um, then my dad died and it wasn't something I was ready for. So I started thinking, you know, what is life about? I've been a nurse for over 40 years. Um, I didn't accomplish what I wanted to accomplish at uh, Lovell's Medical Center, but you know, what made sense for me was to go ahead and retire because the guilt that I had at the time about could I have recognized his um, his symptoms earlier? Did I spend enough time with him? What about my kids? What about my grandchildren? What about me? Um, and I decided at that point that it was time. It was time for me to retire. I I gave 150% to my career. I tried to give as much to my family, but I feel like I hadn't. And I definitely had not taken care of myself. So that's a little bit about my story. Certainly, the three of us, there's so much more, as you know. You, you, you've been in it as well as we have. But what we want to do is talk a little bit about each of us um, at some coping mechanisms that we used to ensure our own resilience. Um, and I think what you'll, you'll hear, if you've not already, um, in, in the journals, uh, the conferences that are coming out, women during this pandemic really showed their stuff, ladies and gentlemen. I know they're gentlemen on this, but <laughs> women really showed their ability to stand up and be mothers, be wives, be daughters, be leaders, be frontline, be informal, be formal. We really did a great job and we made things happen. So Serena, I'm gonna start with you. And um, you know, when we were talking about coping mechanisms, you really, I really loved how you put yours together. So why don't you give us your few? Um, yeah. so. so I think for me, because, and as Nancy said, we all had to kind of step up our game. And um, I think I was surprised at how much I could take on and how much I could juggle in my um, skills for multitasking. And I did have to be there for my mom and my daughter and especially with my husband being gone and, and my staff and my organization. So for me, I, I had to put my mask on myself first. And I think we we hear that when we're taking a trip and, and the airline tells you, put your mask on first. And I really had to learn to do that because I had to have that work-life balance. I love running. I had to continue doing that. I had to continue being there for my family and for my job. But uh, I also was, was told and um, reminded by my leadership, such as Tyra and, and Ron and, and Janelle, to slow down to speed up. Um, you know, it was it was very well said by Bree, this was a, a marathon, not a sprint, and we needed to pace ourselves. Um, I needed to be more present for my daughter. I got so caught up in working, especially when we were remote, it just like your day never stopped. It ended and it started and it kind of collapsed into one another and I needed to be present for my daughter and to play with her and to still be her mom and I remember she would take the phone away from me if we were playing with her toys and she would say mommy put your phone down no more phone and I was like you're absolutely right I need to to be present so that was a lesson for me and finally I think what I learned and I think we all learned this was the possible the impossible became possible all those things that were so overwhelming to us um, in each of our situations and probably in each of your situations, what I learned was the impossible became possible. Amazing. 
You know, um, I would just, uh, that, uh, that definitely resonates with me. And I think about my children who have children, right? Mm -hmm. And same thing, um, they talked about how family, you know, especially these busy young ladies with their, <laughs> their families. I know I was there once, but um, the fact that um, it made some marriages stronger, yeah. um, relationships stronger. And uh, I saw that in my family and I really love that. So Bree, talk about some of your coping mechanisms and. I know you're going to share a little bit about um, uh, your own staff and um, so, um, so I had a very different <laughs> coping mechanism kind of experience than Serena. Um, it it was such long days, and so not I'm going to be really transparent. So it we I just I don't even remember parts of last year. It just was kind of a blur. So um, I ate unhealthy. I didn't take care of myself. I didn't take time. For and neither did my staff. You know, we, all of us, um, many of the nurses that were usually working in three twelves were working four and five twelves in order to, or fourteens to be honest, in order to manage the um, sheer volume of patients that we had. Um, I didn't even feel like I was entitled to take care of myself during this. That there was other priorities out there, and I made the awesome decision of starting school in between the two surges. So that was. That was a great idea. <laughs> um, and, and it was in the long run. I think school was part of what saved me was I had another focus other than just COVID and the unit. Um, it's only been recently in the last uh, month and a half that I've had time to slow down enough to reflect back on what this year has meant to me, how the trauma has set with me and my staff, and how I want to take this and not like acknowledge the trauma that we went through but take this experience and turn it into something that can become like a renaissance in nursing. Um, the amount of resiliency that we have developed out of sure necessity is an amazing thing. And now we have to figure out as leaders how to take that and hone it and develop it and use it as a tool to develop the next generation of nurses and the one after that and to create that cohesiveness and tightness in our units. But also as leaders to not forget that the nurses did go through a lot, a lot of the frontline staff went through so much trauma, like check in with your staff, make sure they're okay, make sure they didn't develop some kind of coping mechanism that is more unhealthy than the drive-through and that they have the resources in which to deal with that if they need them. That's great. You know, um, in, in reflecting on that, Bree, you know, I, I looked at things like 9-11, you know, that, that was a horrible thing that happened. Um, and things happened right then and there, and there was a lot of talk on how do we help folks then. Right. Um, and, and then this was, a, I mean, this just kept going and going and going. So um, I think that is so pertinent that we need to make sure that we debrief. Um, we talked a little bit about military you know, our, our military, our trained, just like our nurses in their discipline or, or whomever, and then they go into war setting, they're deployed. And we know from um, the different conflicts that our military have been in, they have to come back and they post-traumatic stress. That same thing can happen in situations Absolutely. like this. So maybe we learn from um, some of what they do and how do they debrief and, and make it a, a thing that happens that has to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot for us to look at. And then I love the fact, um, Serena, talking about how we made things happen. Yeah. You know, we didn't, yeah. we couldn't, we couldn't drag our feet, right? right. Exactly. And so we're even hearing on a national level how we're taking this and we're looking at healthcare and saying, if we could do it during the pandemic, why can't we fast forward and start really pushing our healthcare um, towards a more positive, more healthy um, healthcare industry? I, I love that. You can tell I'm still involved in <laughs> conferences and stuff, even though I'm retired. So I'm gonna share a couple of my coping mechanisms. So as I told you all, I put 100 plus percent into work. What you probably don't know or realize is I'm an introvert. I don't act like one when I'm in public. Um, I'm very practiced, but I'm exhausted when I go home on a normal day. So, you know, we were working long hours too. And I think for me, I felt some guilt um, that I wasn't providing nursing care. I'm a nursing administrator and I need to understand that's my role. Um, so, you know, 
I kept trying to grasp out how, do, how can I help these folks emotionally? You know, I spent a lot of time with our chaplain talking about things. Um, for me, coping um, includes remembering my faith and praying for my staff. So, you know, I may not have been by their side, but I was definitely praying for them, um, looking at what we could do collectively as a system, as a hospital, as a team to support them in any which way we could, but we need to find out from them. What does that look like? So I love that that you're looking at that, Bree. Um, for me, when I would go home, especially in this world uh, last year, there was so much information about COVID, right? But we also had a lot of racial unrest. We had horrible violence in our country. We had political nightmares. We had people arguing with each other on social media and uh, the TV, just constant. And I have a husband who is really into politics and I'm not. I had to turn it off. I had to turn it off. I knew what was going on, but I did not focus on it. I turned off my social media. Um, I blocked people when I didn't want to read things. Um, and I told my husband, please understand. I love you. I don't want to talk about this. I needed that. So what we did, and it was fine. Um, he spent his time doing his thing. And I found joy in sitting and appliquing because I'm a quilter and an appliquer. And that's what I needed. Um, and many times I just went home, got in bed, turned on a show and stitched because that's what worked for me. So you find what works for you so that you can kind of de-stress. The biggest thing I think y'all that I learned from this, especially um, going through a decision to retire, I had not planned to retire this early. I had things to do, but you know, um, going through my dad's um, death, that was so quick for me. Um, nobody's ever ready, obviously, but, and then going through my period of time to recover, um, I started weighing what's most important. What's most important to me? You know, I don't need to be remembered as the best CNO you know, in the world, right? I want to be remembered as a mom and a wife and a daughter and a grandmother. That's what's important to me. And I know that I've given my all to my career. So give yourself grace. Give yourself grace. I was going to tell you, like, this is the first time I've heard you say that you didn't accomplish everything you wanted to as a CNO. Um, but if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be in school. I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I wouldn't have the confidence to feel like my career can keep moving forward. And so, <laughs> no, thank you. Like, I, like it, it's not, it's, it's not always like, you have impacted my life as a nurse Aww. and a woman forever, Nancy. Thank so, you. Yeah. I need to know you. that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's <laughs> woo. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to do some questions. Um, if we have some questions out there, Miss Becky. We certainly do. But before I throw you a question, we're actually being overwhelmed in the best possible way with comments from people oh. so grateful that you've shared your stories and how many coping mechanisms people have have heard just in what you've already said i've already uh written down slow down to speed up and give yourself grace i'm thinking about making some t-shirts on that I like um, it. and then uh, tyra i'm sure you and your team are listening but i think Bree's renaissance and nursing is a perfect topic for when we Whenever we get to have a leadership conference again, I think that's a great time. <laughs> but I do have a couple of questions. So the first one is, um, when I listened to this, the first thought that was just jumping in my head as each of you spoke was, what do we as a company do? What were we doing to support you guys? And, and how can we do that better? So uh, is, what, is there some learning from that for, I'm hoping I won't see another pandemic, but there'll be something somewhere where we need to help our frontline workers both, you know, lift them up. So, I, yeah, Becky, I think Bree yeah. should answer that question. Yeah. She's yeah. the closest to it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I think that during this this last year and moving forward, my staff loved the food and the support and <laughs> all of all of the. It felt good, but what they really, really want right now is face time with their leaders to be validated in the experience that they have had. They want people to hear their stories, the things they went through, the patience that they've lost, the grief, the trauma of the good, but they, they really just want to be validated. They want that 
that time to sit down and not virtually and not in a separate room. They want one on one time with leadership to say, this is what we went through. This is this is the struggle I have. And I want that recognized. And I want, I want to know that if we do have another surge, that I'm going to have a support system in place for my leadership. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Good. What about uh... What about supporting each other as leaders? Like, I'm sure there were decisions that had to be made that were extremely difficult. And how did you look to one another and to the others in the leadership group for help with that? Uh, you know what, I think I'll pick that up. Um, so, you know, early on uh, in the pandemic, we lost a uh, position, an intensivist. Um, he passed away unexpectedly and um, the emotions were raw. It was very, very painful to the ICU, the staff, to us, to um, his partners. And but we were all in incident command and working hard to propel things forward. And I think that um, what we would find from time to time, we had those emotions that were hard to harness. We had to be the leaders, right? Um, and then and, and then going forward and making decisions um, that weren't always easy. So one of the things that Dr. Sandoval and I, um, she's our chief medical officer, and Vesta and I, I think we form such a strong bond. Um, we we spent some time together in private and allowed each other tears if we needed to, anger if we needed it, just to listen to each other. And I'll tell you what, that really got us through. And then giving each other permission to rest. We, you know, I again, and I've said this before. You know, we weren't in there doing the care. And so, um, you know, you don't measure what you do against what somebody else is having to do. And we would typically just work really long hours and stretches. And even when we were off, we were working. You got to take time away. And and we gave each other permission. Yeah. So we need to give each other permission. And then the other thing I would say is we need to, um, now I'm going to be transparent. I'm retired now. <laughs> Um, we need to really, we've got our corporate offices, everybody really trying to help uh, promote and, and keep people on the same page. And we've got our division and then we've got our hospital, right? And we had so many meetings, um, you know, if we could kind of combine some of those meetings, because guess what? There was a lot of the same information in each of those meetings. Yeah. I think that that would help us. I think time management during this, but again, understanding, and we all do, yeah. this was new for all of us. Yeah. You know, we did the best we could do and we did a great job, Ardent. Um, but I think going for, you know, if we were to do this again or find ourselves in a crisis mode like this to keep some of those things um, in perspective. Sorry, did you have anything to add to that? I saw you nodding along or the <laughs> topic of taking time for yourself. Cause I really, I really appreciated hearing that Ron Stern was someone who said, okay, here's a coping technique. I love that. It responds to what Bree said about having the leaders acknowledge, but is anything else about taking care of yourself that you learned or tips for the rest of us? Well, you know, I think Becky, that's exactly it is, is having them just say, what else can I do to support you? Um, that was helpful. And that self care and giving yourself grace and and trying to do the things that make you feel better about yourself. It's it's interesting because sometimes we feel guilty if we do and guilty if we don't. Yeah. yeah. If, if we take that trip, guilty if we don't. Guilty if we go out for a run or guilty if we don't. And but we need to do it for ourselves and the people we love. Quite honestly, absolutely. because my daughter, who was three, has absolutely no idea what was going on or what was happening in this pandemic. She just wanted to still go to the park. She still wanted to play with mom. She still, you know, we wanted to FaceTime with dad and we, she still wanted to do all of those same things. So I just needed to remember that. You know, maybe this is a topic for another uh, program, but I, I really wonder what that age cohort will take away and remember from this. I think that would be fun to talk about sometime. Um, but Brie, part, partly as a taking off on your comment about the renaissance of nursing. So do you think that what's what the nursing profession has gone through will discourage or encourage people from pursuing those careers now? Um, do you I have think, a feel for that? Yeah, no, I, I think that, um, there is there is always going to be a little intrepidation around healthcare for the next year or so, but ultimately, 
the public has now seen what nurses truly do. Like we are not uh, some Grey's Anatomy character that is carrying <laughs> out a doctor's order. Like I said, we are the compassion in healthcare. And I think that the nurses that have made it through the pandemic on the other side know this, take pride in that. And that is gonna be the thing that changes how we view nursing. I like I guarantee there's gonna be new nursing theories that come out of this. We're gonna see a whole influx of new people coming into the profession and it is gonna grow and develop in a way that we haven't seen in the past. I think that would be a huge positive. Sorry, Nance. I think that would be a huge positive. Absolutely. If I could interject, I will say, and I don't know if this happened in the other hospitals, and, and to bolster what um, Bree said, the, the um, profession of nursing is a very honorable but very difficult profession. It's mm -hmm. stressful. And we did have staff, young staff, um, come in and say, you know what? This isn't what I signed up for. Yeah. So I think that the profession of nursing takes on even more of a, this is a, a, an amazing profession. And it takes the strong and the resilient to be those nurses. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question, kind of lightning round. For everybody can answer in turn. Uh, do you see light at the end of the tunnel? And is there something you're looking forward to? But I'm asking this question because I'm so glass half full. It drives my husband nuts, but I want to end on a positive note. So is there something you're looking forward to now, Serena? Yes. <laughs> I, yes, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Absolutely. I am glass half full as well. And I am looking forward to spending more time with my family and friends and traveling who do not live in my home. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. How about you, Bree? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. It, it, the tunnel, uh, the, it's, it's not just there, like it's shining. Like we can <laughs> see it and it feels really, really good. Um, and what am I looking at traveling? I, I have missed traveling so much and um, I'm really looking forward to like, I'm tired of hearing new normal. I want a better normal. Yeah, I hear you. Okay, Nancy, last, you, you can wrap it up. Obviously I'm retired, but I've had to try to keep <laughs> convincing myself. So, all right, I actually am looking so forward to traveling. Um, it wasn't quite, it's not quite what I had planned, obviously, when I retired, but I will share that I am going to be going somewhere next month and putting my feet in some warm sand. <laughs> yes. That is an excellent restorative location. And I'm really looking forward to hugging. I saw y'all hug and I got a little tear in my eye because I, I can't wait to keep get back to hugging people. And I wish that you all could, this format doesn't let you all experience with applause or even seeing our faces that we've been laughing and crying with you uh, throughout this today. And we just thank you so much for your contributions and for being part of the program. Thank you for inviting us. So, um, Rachel, if you'll pop up the last slide and I'll close things out on time. Um, thanks to all of you for participating today. And before you pop I'm off, on this last slide, we have a QR code where you can take a post-session survey. We really appreciate your doing that and giving us your feedback because that's where we get programming ideas that will be interesting and meaningful to all of you. On the right side of the screen is that QR code for the uh, Women in Arden Champions questionnaire again, and it's also in the chat function I see. And then stay tuned in the next two weeks for more information about our April session. We appreciate all of your participation and look forward to seeing you next month. Bye-bye.